All right, the children will depart for their class now. Let's begin our time in prayer. You know, Father, you've come down from heaven, and we don't know how, quite how much and quite how far you descended, quite how much you gave up. Lord, we are unworthy of the least of your affections. We are unworthy, Lord, to be the recipients of this great uh, gospel that we will uh, learn about again today. Uh, so, Lord, we humble ourselves to receive it with thanksgiving, and we ask you, Lord, to uh, refine us and change us, and by your Holy Spirit to remake us into the image of your Son and come down to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Carl, Alshonda, for what you do every week. You know, the, the probably the most touching thing that just happened in the past half hour is Carl asked Rhea, Rhea, what does God want for Christmas? And he said, she said, uh, you. And you often wonder, you know, are our children listening? And are they taking it in? And um, she is. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. All right, so Philippians chapter 2, again, not a passage you would typically turn to uh, in talking about Christmas. But I'm trying to, I'm trying to go outside of Matthew uh, chapter 2 and Luke chapter 2. Uh, for uh, the instruction about the, uh, the incarnation and our Christmas because it's found in many, many places. Um, so uh, last week, uh, again, we began this series and um, uh, we talked about that what can happen on Christmas is every year is that uh, it Christmas can kind of become like an, uh, y your old favorite song. And the reason it's your old favorite song is because it's just gotten old and now you have a new favorite song. And so we memorize, you know, the uh, scriptures that speak of uh, the, the Christmas, you know, the angels and the wise men. And because uh, we hear it so much, it can become rather old. And so what I'm trying to do uh, last week and this week is uh, give us new depth to, the, of to what happened on Christmas. So, the, uh, so uh, Matthew and Luke both tell us what happened on Christmas the passages we've been talking about tell us why, uh, what, what it means, not what happened, but what it means. So last week we talked about three things Christmas means. This week I want to talk about three more things Christmas means uh, from Philippians chapter 2. The first one is this. Christmas means, and this is in your bulletin, God divested for us. Christmas means humility is the essence of holiness. And thirdly, Christmas means to be filled, we must be emptied. Christmas means God divested for us. Christmas means humility is the essence of holiness. Christmas means to be filled, we must be emptied. So the, the, the descension of Jesus from heaven to earth on Christmas is by far the farthest anyone ever fell. If you fell off of Mount Everest and landed at the bottom of the ocean, <laughs> you would not have fallen farther than Jesus descended on Christmas. Okay, um, And so the, this heavenly descension of God coming down is, is a core doctrine of the Christian faith. Um, and, and so we call it the incarnation. Right. So here in Philippians 2, he, here's the incarnation. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. That's the incarnation. Okay, So to humble yourself, folks, is to, uh, is to willfully uh, take a position beneath another. And th so the definition of actually of this Greek word, uh, to hum Jesus humbled himself, the definition of this Greek word is to be low in situation or condition, to be poor, to be lowly, or to be modest. So Jesus, the creator of the universe, descended into earth. He humbled himself. He took a position beneath, not above. So he was born in a manger, not a palace, right? He was born as a peasant, not a prince. He, uh, th and this is the, the, the aspect of Christmas that I want to focus on today. And one way to think about this is, is to think about not just how far 
Jesus descended, but think about how much he divested when he descended, all right? So in 1986, Francis Rowley wrote the song, I Will Sing the Wondrous Story. You know that song, right? And the first verse of the song says, I will sing the wonderful story of the Christ who died for me, how he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Right? The monumentalness of the incarnation is not just how far Jesus descended, but all that he divested himself of when he descended. So he divested himself of his home in glory to, uh, for the cross. He divested perfection to inhabit imperfection. He traded the heavenly throne for a manger bed, and this he did willfully, okay? And so I think perhaps the best way to grasp this incredible, we'll call it the incredible divestation, okay, is, is by analogy. H have you ever had to willfully divest yourself of something uh, of value for the sake of someone else? Have you ever had to willfully give up something uh, of value for the sake of somebody else. So I, I want to give you my personal uh, divestation story in order to grasp better uh, what, uh, what Jesus really gave up. So when I was young, uh, school was uh, very enjoyable to me. That was up until about seventh grade, okay? And so, you know, I was, I was athletic, I was popular, I was generally, I generally thought of myself as one of the good kids you know, who would grow to, uh, you know, uh, make their parents proud. My grades were always good. I'd get home, uh, you know, from school, and I would do my homework immediately like an OCD freak, right? And, uh, <laughs> and I didn't act these ways because I was hungry for love and attention that I wasn't getting. I had plenty of that, okay? But instead, uh, I, I believe there was something in my young spirit that would never be satisfied with enough praise or affirmation. So this is part of my Celebrate Recovery testimony. Um, is is this longing for praise and affirmation? That's what that's what I struggle with. Okay, and so my athletic ability and popularity in school, combined with this longing for praise, brought with it an arrogance and a callousness toward others. I was cocky and I was proud. And but this all changed one day of my seventh grade year. So my class and I were out outside at recess. Uh, enjoying a cool fall day before school let out. A group of, group of boys, uh, we were gathered at the side of the school, and we were having fun running and jumping off the slope of a ramp. Okay? You know, as boys do, you just run and jump, and it's fun. And as we ran single file behind each other, running and jumping and doing tricks in the air, I thought it'd be fun to push the boy in front of me every time I landed. And in some ways, I remember feeling better than this boy. He was, he was a neighbor friend of mine who came from a broken home. His family was poor, and I knew he kind of looked up to me. And so as we ran and leaped off a small ramp at school, I repeatedly pushed my friend as I landed behind him. And about the fifth time I pushed him, he got so upset that he turned around and slugged me in the face. <laughs> okay, hallelujah, thank you. Uh, this is about humility today, right? And so I remember the shock uh, that he, the, the, the I, I remember being shocked that he was upset at me. Now, granted, if somebody did that to me five times, I'd be upset too, but for some reason it didn't click. Okay? And so the moment he hit me, uh, the sound of my parents' voice uh, came to my mind. Sean, you never hit anybody. Now, apparently it was okay to pick on people, but you couldn't hit them, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and because I wanted to please my parents, I didn't hit him back. I simply held him back off of me until the teacher came and broke us up. And so from that point forward, uh, I became known in school as the person you could pick on who would never fight back. Right. And, so I, and so I remember I, I remained fairly confident uh, in myself for the first month or so uh, or two after this incident. But over time... The put-downs and the treatment I received from other kids in the school kind of broke me down. So in one school year, I went from being a cocky, confident, preppy jock to being a weak and defenseless boy who cried leaving school every day. So this was my personal dissension. Okay? From this point forward, I became divested of a lot. I, 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 div I divest, divested my former popularity. I divested my confidence. I divested my arrogance. Thank God. But this is not the divestment that I really want to tell you about. Okay? 
By the end of that school year, my parents had become so distraught at seeing me so distraught that they didn't know what to do. And so we had, they had conferences with the teachers to address, you know, Sean's daily getting picked on. Um, they, would, they would talk to me every night just enough to build me up uh, to go back into the school uh, without me breaking down again. And finally one night after months and months of, of this going on, my, my dad was so fed up with it all that he laid into me. And I remember standing in the kitchen and him saying to me, Sean, you're either going to go into that school tomorrow and punch those boys in the face, or I'm going in myself and you'll never return to that school again. And so something clicked in me that night. It's like a switch went off, and now I had confidence. And so I woke up in the morning, bound and determined that the moment one of those boys started with me, we're going to town, <laughs> okay? And so I remember sitting in art class, right, the ne and the next day, and sure enough, one of the boys started in on me across the table, and I resolved in my heart uh, to confront him after the class was over. And so I patiently waited for the bell to ring, and as the bell rang, I followed directly behind the boy, and as we exited the classroom into the hallway, I grabbed him by the shirt, I turned him around, I threw him up against the wall, and I punched him in the stomach, but the problem is I missed. <laughs> I, uh, I was, it was about two inches off from his stomach, and I hit his hip. So I probably hurt my hand more than I hurt him. But the, <laughs> the look in my face that he saw, I said, okay, Sean's serious, and I never had to deal with that boy again. Uh, I had to start one more fight the following week, but after that, the bullying stopped and the road to healing began. Now, I'm not saying that this is the way for every child to resolve his or her bullying problems, okay? But the bullying did stop for me at that point. And so, to assist in my healing, my parents sent me to a prep school my freshman year, uh, and, and that was very good for me. New places, new people, new things, that was very, very good for me. But at the end of my freshman year, we had a family meeting in our kitchen in which our parents told us that, we, that we, they could no longer afford to send us to the prep school and that my older brother and I were going to, and they had no choice but to return, that we had no choice but to return to the public school we had gone to before. And when my parents told me this, I remember feeling like I was drowning again. And so I ran upstairs, I lay, laid on my bed, I put my head in my pillow, and I just cried. And a few minutes later, my dad came up, and he, and he stood beside my bed, and he, and he said something that changed uh, my life, and I've never told this story without this happening. <laughs> he said, Sean, I don't care if the President of the United States says I can't, you're not going back to that school. And by that, he meant the school that I had been bullied out of. And so the next week or so, my parents made some phone calls to people in authority in the Plymouth School District. We lived in the newfound school district at the time, and the advice that they were given was that since they owned a business in Plymouth for the past 20 years, he could just claim the business address as our home address and send the kids to Plymouth schools. And the reasoning was, well, since you pay taxes in the town already, it's okay, okay? Well, so we transferred to Plymouth School District. I joined the football team in the fall. I was making friends. Life was going very well for me. And then one day, our neighbor in not Plymouth turned us in. And she told the authorities that we did not, fa in fact, live in Plymouth, but we lived outside of the district. And so the issue was investigated. The New Hampshire Attorney General got involved. And, and in just a few days, the New Hampshire Union leader had on the front page of their paper Bridgewater man indicted, indicted for sending kids to Plymouth School. And uh, so my parents woke us up 6 a.m. that morning that the paper was produced uh, to show us the paper and to prepare us for any questions that we might have in school that day. And at that point, my parents had to make a decision. They would either have to pay $20,000 to the town of Plymouth for sending four kids to Plymouth schools unlawfully for one month and then send us back to newfound schools where we belonged, or they would have to pay $20,000 to the town of Plymouth, sell their dream home in Bridgewater that they had just built two years ago, and purchase a new home in Plymouth so that we could continue to go to Plymouth schools legally without further, without further consequence. And so what did they do? Well, they paid the $20,000, divested themselves of their dream home and bought a new home in Plymouth all so that I could heal. 
my brothers would have been fine in the other school, not me. Two months later, because of my parents' colossal divestment of their dream home and their reputation, I met and shortly thereafter began dating a girl from Plymouth who would later become uh, my wife and the mother of my five kids today. Praise God. That's right. Folks, the monumentalness of the incarnation is not just how far Jesus descended in coming to earth, but in all that he divested when he came to earth. Okay? He left his home in glory. He let it go. He divested himself of it. Why? So that we could heal, so that we could be saved. Jesus divested himself of his home in glory in order to give us a home in glory. Right? And in this way, what my parents did for me was just a mini microcosm of what Jesus did for the world when he came to earth. Okay. My parents divested their dream home and their reputation, but Jesus divested himself of glory for me and for you. Okay. So this is the first thing we see. Christmas means God divested for us. Okay. The second thing Christmas means is this. Christmas means humility is the essence of holiness. So Philippians 2, 5 says, Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. I like the way uh, the message paraphrases this. It says, think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what, not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave. He became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death and the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. That's the message, okay? Folks, Christmas shows us, shows us that humility is the essence of holiness. Now, I want you to see that, that humility is not just a characteristic that Jesus assumed when he came to earth. Humility is a fundamental characteristic of the Trinity. I love what Andrew Murray said in his book, Humility, the Beauty of Holiness. He said, if we love Christ above everything, we must love humility above everything, for humility is the very es essence of his life and glory and the salvation he brings. He says, just think about it. Where did it begin? Is there humility in heaven? You know there is. For they cast their crowns before the throne of God and the Lamb. But is there humility on the throne of God? Yes. What was it but heavenly humility that made Jesus on the throne willing to say, I will go down to be a servant and to die for man. I will go and live as the meek and lowly lamb of God. He says, Jesus brought humility from heaven to us. It was humility that brought him to earth or he never would have come. Okay. Jesus, folks, is the personification of humility, and you've probably never thought about God that way. Like we think about God as holy, we think about God as mighty, uh, but we don't tend to think of him as humble. And I want you to see how often Jesus spoke of his own humility. Listen to these verses. The son can do nothing of himself, John 5, 19. I can of my own self do nothing. My judgment is just because I seek not my own will, John 5, 30. I receive not glory from men. John 5, 41. I am come not to do my own will. John 6, 38. My teaching is not mine. John 7, 16. I am not come of myself. John 7, 28. I do nothing of myself. John 8, 28. I have not come of myself, but he sent me. John 8, 42. I seek not my own glory. John 8, 50. The words that I say, I speak not from myself. John 14, 10. The word which you hear is not mine, John 14, 24. And that's just in the Gospel of John, folks. Okay. Christ's whole life was marked by humility. 
Andrew Murray went on to say, he might have chosen another form in which to appear. He might have come in the form of a king, but he chose the form of a servant. He made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself. He said, the son of man has not come to be ministered unto, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And you know, in the last night, he took the place of a slave and girded himself with a towel and went to wash the feet of Peter and the other disciples. He went, Murray went on to say, Beloved, the life of Jesus upon earth was a life of the deepest humility. My Lord Christ took a low place all the time his walk on earth. He took a very low place when he began to wash the disciples' feet, but when he went to Calvary, he took the lowest place there was to be found in the universe of God, the very lowest, and he let sin and the curse of sin and the wrath of God cover him. He took the place of a guilty sinner that he might bear our load, that he might serve us in saving us from our wretchedness, that he might by his precious blood win deliverance for us, that he might by that blood wash us from our stain and our guilt. Folks, Jesus is the deified embodiment of humility. This is what Christmas shows us. And now I want you to see just how much how often Jesus taught us about humility. He didn't just say that, he didn't just personify humility. He taught about it. Matthew 10, 27, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, as, even as the Son of Man came to serve. At the beginning of his ministry, in the famous Sermon on the Mount, okay, the very first words of the Sermon on the Mount Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. In the very first sermon, Jesus proclaimed the open gate through which we enter heaven. The poor who have nothing in themselves and the, and the meek who seek nothing in themselves. Jesus said, these are the blessings of heaven. Matthew 18, Jesus' disciples had been disputing about who would be the greatest and they asked Jesus about it, and to their question, Jesus said, a child in their midst, and he said, whoever shall humble himself as this little child shall be exalted. Matthew 20, the sons of Zebedee had asked Jesus to sit on his right hand and his left in the highest place in the kingdom, but Jesus said that they must not look or ask for that. Instead, their thoughts should be on the cup of suffering, not on their exaltation. And then he added, whoever would be chief among you, let him be your servant even as the Son of Man came to serve. Jesus said the lowliest of the spirit, the lowliest of spirit is nearest to God in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 23, 11, speaking to the Pharisees and their love of the chief seats, he said, he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. On another occasion, Luke 14, while in the house of a Pharisee, Jesus told the parable of a guest who, who, who would be invited to come up higher and added, for whosoever shall exalt himself will be abased, and he that humble himself will be exalted. Luke 18, Jesus told the parable of the Pharisee and tax collector. Remember that? The Pharisee prayed to God, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Here's all the good that I do. <laughs> but the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And in summary, Jesus said that everything is worthless by the worshiper. That is not pervaded by deep, true humility towards God and man. Okay. And then two more teachings from Jesus. After washing his disciples' feet in John 13, Jesus said, If I then, the Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. And then in the Last Supper, the same night, Luke 22, just hours before he is led away to be crucified, and after three full years of ministry with his disciples, okay, they were still disputing on the night he was about to leave of who should be first. <laughs> and Jesus said this, he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. I am among you as he that serveth. Okay? Folks, Christmas shows us that humility is the essence of holiness because Jesus was the embodiment of humility descended from heaven. But I think you'd agree how seldom, uh, how seldom we see the humility of Jesus modeled in the lives of Christians a lot of times, right? And the reason I think humility is so seldom seen is because pride is so everywhere prominent 
and so hard to identify in ourselves. Now, we can identify it in someone else, and we don't like it, but then we can't see the same thing in ourselves. Okay? And folks, we can find the poison of pride uh, just as much in active religion as we can in secular individualism. And so in this way, we don't just need to be saved from the sins of stealing or of murdering or of homosexuality or of adultery or of swearing. We need to be saved from that which is at the root of all sin, our self-will and our pride. All right. So what is the cause of all division and strife and envying that is so often found among God's saints? Why is it that there is bitterness and discord and a tug of war between opinions within churches? What is the cause of hard judgments and hasty words? What's the cause of estrangement between friends? What's the cause of evil speaking? What is the cause of selfishness and indifference to the feelings of others? Simply this, pride. Okay. And so here's what I want to see, folks. The disciples spent three years with Jesus. They heard his teachings about the poor and the meek, and yet still, on the very night they were with him, the very last night they were with him, were asking who should be first. <laughs> and here's what this shows us. It shows us that no amount of spiritual instruction or personal mentoring on the subject of humility will ever produce humility in your heart. No amount of spiritual instruction or personal mentoring on the subject of humility will ever produce humility in your heart. In fact, oftentimes, spiritual instruction leads to the opposite, does it not? Okay. Humility is never something you can work on acquiring. <laughs> what we've just seen in Christ's incredible dissension and divestment of his heavenly home is that humility is nothing you can ever produce in yourself because the moment you produced it in yourself is the moment it would disappear because you would say, look what I did. <laughs> right? Right. So then how do we acquire this, heaven, this heavenly humility? Well, that's our next point. So Christmas means God uh, divested for us. Christmas means humility is the essence of holiness. And thirdly, Christmas means to be filled, we must be emptied. You may be thinking, as I did in my preparations, how can I ever attain to the humility of Jesus Christ? I will never be like that. Okay? Uh, one preacher likened the humility of Jesus to looking through a pane of glass at a store window at a product you would really like to have. But however much you would like to have it, the pane of glass... Uh, prevents you from grabbing it. And so I want you to see that the humility of Jesus is not unreachable. So here's, here's a connection I want you to make. For all of our discussion this morning on humility, all we've really talked about is faith. The way we access this humility is by faith because the poorness of spirit Jesus speaks of and true and abiding faith are one and the same. For what is faith in the God of the Bible? Isn't it nothing more than a complete emptying of yourself and dependency upon him? Right? And as we've said before, faith is not the belief that God can do things for me. Faith is the heartfelt confession that I can't do anything without him. This is both the definition of faith and the content of true humility. We access the humility of Jesus by faith. And so to the attainment of humility, uh, two stories of faith, I think, will help. The first one is the a, a story of the centurion in Matthew 8. The second one is a story of the uh, mother of a sick daughter in Matthew 15. So a centurion was a, a Roman uh, soldier in charge of a hundred men, hence the word sent centurion, okay? And uh, so this man uh, approached Jesus, pleading with him to heal his servant uh, who was paralyzed. So Jesus prepared to go to his house to perform the healing. And, and Jesus marveled at this man's faith because, um, because he said to Jesus, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. And in response to that, Jesus said, I have not seen such faith even in Israel. 
And I believe that the marveling that Jesus felt about this man was the fact that this man was a man of great power who was in truth absent of pride. Something you never see, right? This man had great power, but he knew himself to be nothing in God's eyes. Jesus marveled because his faith was blooming with the beauty of heavenly humility. And the second story is a story of the mother of a sick daughter. Okay? She, too, approached Jesus. She was a, a Gentile woman, a Canaanite, and she said to Jesus, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. And to this, Jesus gave a very harsh reply. He said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. And rather than get offended by this silencing statement, she humbled herself and was willing to accept the name of a dog. For she replied, yea, Lord, but even dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus said, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. These two people, folks, evidenced uh, true faith in Christ because they considered God to be all and themselves to be nothing. And what is that but nothing more than faith? That is heavenly humility. The, uh, they, they emptied themselves. They made God their all and were willing to consider themselves as unworthy even of the least of God's affections. These two individuals were truly humble and Jesus marveled at them. So practically speaking, as we close today, how do we acquire this heavenly humility and death to self? How do we acquire this heavenly humility and death to self? Well, so four, four things here. Number one, empty yourself of all pride in yourself. Empty yourself of all pride in yourself. How so? Well, bow before the Lord each morning and say, Lord, whatever I am, I am because of you. And whatever I shall be, I shall be because of you. I have nothing without you. You are my all and all. Without you, I am nothing at all. Humble yourself. Empty yourself as Jesus divested himself of glory for you. So you divest yourself of all pride to him every morning. And, and, um, and you do not start your day until you've confessed his greatness and your dependency. Start there. Okay? Empty yourself of all pride in yourself. Secondly, Realize that this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, is a work of God in you and not your work. So just as uh, spiritual knowledge directly from Jesus <laughs> did not produce humility in the disciples, so our own effort uh, will never produce humility in us either. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. And this way, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, more, anybody want to be filled with the Holy Spirit more? <laughs> okay. Never enough. That's right. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit more, you must be emptied of yourself more and more. The Holy Spirit cannot fill a person who is still so full of themselves. The Holy Spirit, folks, is the life of the disposition, the temper, and the inclinations of Jesus himself brought down from heaven into your heart. The less of you there is, the more of him there can be. Okay? Therefore, if you want more of the fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life, the emptier, empty yourself. It's God's work in you. Thirdly, you must be willing to accept. This is a hard one. You must be willing to accept every humiliation. You must begin to look at every slight you receive as God's means to humble you. Do not be afraid to be humbled. Do not fear going too low. If you want the Holy Spirit to fill you more and more, humble yourself even unto death as Jesus did. Embrace humility. Seek it. Do not run from it or be angry when you are humbled. <laughs> Descend each day into that helpless dependence on God because as water fills the first of the lowest places, so the Holy Spirit will fill the lowest place in your heart. And then the fourth recommendation is this. Realize that nothing but the presence of Jesus can expel the self. Nothing but the presence of Jesus can expel the self. 
when Paul was on the road to Damascus, his spirit finally became empty of itself because he was blinded by the person of Jesus Christ. If you want your pride to go and humility to grow, fix your gaze on Jesus every day. Open your Bible every day to find Jesus. Arise to sup with him. We will lose ourselves more and more the more we are consumed with our Savior. Only in seeing him greater as Paul did can the self be dissolved. So folks, Christmas means that to be filled, <coughs> we must be empty. And so as we prepare to surround communion uh, again today, I, I wonder I wonder if today is the day that we flood this stage on our knees, hands raised, asking God to empty us and fill us with him. I wonder if today is a day when we publicly confess, Lord, I have had so little of you because I am still so full of me. Not a one of us does not need to empty ourselves more. Not a one of us does not need uh, more of his filling. Not a one of us does not need more of ourself poured out and more of him poured in. On this last Sunday before Christmas, perhaps the best we can do as a congregation is all come forward on bended knee confessing, Lord, you divest it all from me. Now divest all of me for you. Right? Take from me my pride. Take from me my will. Take from me myself that the, so that the very spirit of yourself, the Holy Spirit, may dwell more perfectly in me. Do you, do you see a little more of what Christmas means for us, folks? Is the beauty and holiness and perfection and glory and divine humility of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, dissolving all of yourself? Have you held back from God because you were afraid of where true surrender might bring you? Well, perhaps today is the day you divest of all yourself in response to his great divestation for you. And so as the music plays, uh, if it's appropriate for you, come. Come and fill this stage with cries of emptying. Is that not worship? We're going to stand. We're going to form two lines. And if, it's, if you feel called, come and empty yourself. I'll be over off to the right. Maureen will be over, off to, uh, over to the left. If there's some more specific need that you have, come as we commune together. Sun.